so so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Fulton. I'm the executive director of the American Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists. Uh, and that, that organization, AAJLJ, together with the American Jewish Committee and the JCRC of Greater Washington, are the sponsors and organizers of this brown bag lunch, which today involves having lunch at your computer, probably. Uh, and we're joined today by Harvey, Harvey Ryder, who is uh, usually the host of this event in his in his law office. Uh, and and also uh, there may be other folks on the line who are involved with the organizations that I've just mentioned. Uh, most, most crucially, uh, we have today a, a speaker who is an old friend and a comrade in arms uh, from the years that I was with the American Jewish Committee and she was with the ADL, uh, Stacey Burdett, who is going to speak to us today about from the boardroom to the dorm room, how to make fighting anti-Semitism an American civic value. Uh, Stacey works with corporations, nonprofits, and policymakers on strategies to prevent and respond to anti-Semitism and to integrate that work into systems and institutional cult culture. She served as the ADL's Vice President for Government Relations, Advocacy, and Community Engagement, and was the Director of Government and External Relations at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in D.C. She has served on advisory boards for a variety of organizations and continues her work today as a consultant for anti-Semitism prevention and response. Stacey, it's great to see you. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to moderate this, uh, this session with you and please uh, take it away. Thank you so much. And thank you, Vicki and Harvey and um, to all of the co-hosts. Uh, so what I'd like to do is I, I'm going to give an overview of what I mean by the frame of how to make anti-Semitism a civic value. And I, I really want to invite, I want to have like a chunky amount of question and answer time because it's a big group, but it's not that big. And um, I'm going to say some things that you, that you want to ask about, I hope. So, you know, no one needs a briefing on we're all very well versed in the data and the incidents and the anecdotes that we're just saturated with. We talk about this issue so much. We know which one of our friends has which ideological view about where's the line between anti-Israel speech and anti-Semitism. And of course, we, we all divide people in our friend group, in our office, based on whose fault do you think it is? Those peeps are those peeps. And it's such a big change. You are in the meeting now. When I first started working on anti-Semitism issues in like the 80s and 90s, which Richard is probably the first when I first met you, we had to remind people that anti-Semitism used to be a problem and we should still be vigilant about it. I mean, even and especially in Jewish audiences. And then we started saying, well, hey, look at France, look at Western Europe. Um, anti-Semitism is pretty resilient. It's still a problem. And now today, we never, Richard, could have predicted, right? Like all of our organizations were pivoting resources away from anti-Semitism response because we, we thought we won. And we never really envisioned. And the people that were lobbying and trying to bring into this work are also in like, state of shock. No one ever thought that this would once again be part of just the elevator music of American life. And but because we are a community right now, so caught up in debates about what our competing narratives are about anti-Semitism and who causes it and where it comes from, it gets in the way of precious energy we need to do something about it. And we, as Jewish leaders and Jewish activists and organization board members, the way we speak about anti-Semitism shows others what they can do about it. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we speak about the problem and how that affects the way people think they can help and what they can do about it and what we are teaching our children and our friends at Shul, what they can do about it. Um, because the most immediate action that we take, whether it's as Jewish leaders who shape how an organization responds, or our friends or Jewish reporters or Jewish members of Congress, this big, big Jewish society that we're in, 
people take the lead from us. And when we speak about the issue in an action-oriented frame, politicians hear it. When we speak about it in a counterproductive way, they will take counterproductive action. Um, so uh, that that is a, a concern that I have at this moment in our work, that we can potentially be framing the problem of anti-Semitism in a way that makes it an American civic value or we can speak about it in a way that further divides people from us when we need them the most. And I think we never thought, like American Jews are experiencing something right now that we used to see in, first in Eastern Europe and then maybe in Western Europe, where there's graffiti painted on the synagogue and maybe the prime minister of the country will come with the Windex and help you clean it off, but your next door neighbor or the mayor or the local cops don't have empathy for what you're going through. And we're in a little bit of that situation ourselves now where President Biden, you know, did the first national strategy against anti-Semitism. My old boss, Abe Foxman, was in tears when it was unveiled because he was born under Nazism. And again, compared to that experience, he never believed an American president would be making a national mobilization in his in every executive agency to protect Jews. It's very moving. And so at the top level, there's a lot of commitment. But what I hear and what we hear is what are Jewish communities hungering for and lacking? We feel like our neighbors, our local civic organizations, our, our children's teachers. You are don't in the meeting now. We feel like they don't fundamentally understand what's wrong and why we feel vulnerable. We feel alienated. And that has been a frustration we hear a lot. We target that frustration is targeted a lot at progressives, liberals, and Democrats. That's because that's who Jews predominantly vote for. Those are our partners. Um, so when I focus on anti-Semitism in coalitions or in institutions or in agencies, I always emphasize my number one learning from uh, Richard, 35 years, maybe 30 years, it's a long time. My number one learning is that when we focus on anti-Semitism, it teaches us how hate works. Anti-Semitism, I know there are things that are specific about it. It's very old. It has it has come up in different forms over time. But anti-Semitism is a scapegoating and otherizing 101 class. Anti-Semitism is, is really a meta frame for how hate and conspiracies work. And the impact on us of anti-Semitism right now is demonstrating some of those principles. Hate makes its targets feel alone and alienated. It stigmatizes the group. You worry that you don't fit in. And the fact that that can be happening to us now, such a stable, successful community that felt so a part of the public square here, the fact that we feel that way, wow, that shows what hate does to trans people, to Black people, to all targets of bigotry. And the anti-Semitism conspiracy theory is really on display now. It is driving the hate movement. And so anti-Semitism, it's like the mother of all conspiracy theories. It's triggered by fears people have of modernity, of the civil rights movement, of diversity, whatever the social turmoil is, it translates into needing to blame someone. And we are scapegoat number one. Other communities often are scapegoat number one and a half or two. And anti-Semitism shows that hate is always on the margins. It's attractive to different societies in different situations. So when we look through history at how anti-Semitism has evolved, I see a series of societies that at different times needed hate. They had the conditions and the circumstances were right, whether it was, you know, Jews as an enemy of Christianity or Jews as racially inferior when eugenics was very popular. So we fall on different parts of the racial map, which we're very conscious of now. 
And we move back and forth. We toggle back and forth on that trajectory of insider, outsider. Sometimes we're the ultimate insider. Sometimes we're the ultimate outsider. Today, people are saying, you guys are such insiders. How could you feel like outsiders? And again, as I said, we, we are the ultimate insiders in America, but we feel alone right now. We feel marginalized. And that's kind of a puzzle to people. So I try to, we complicate what we say about anti-Semitism and we argue with each other about it and that's fine. And I, I welcome those questions. But for an external audience, I tell people anti-Semitism is only one thing. And it's one thing spelled with three letters. It's just a lie. It's a lie about Jews to blame us for what's wrong. That's what it was in the 30s in Germany. And it's very effective. And no matter who is espousing that lie, no matter what community you're in, your generate, no matter what generation you're in, no matter what your ethnicity is, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, it's a lie to blame us for what's wrong in the world. And a lot is wrong in the world. So on the subject of making anti-Semitism a civic value, not every group may need that. We do. Jews have always wanted to be part of the vibrant civic life of every country we've ever lived in. And certainly for American Jews, it's, it's kind of a civic religion, right? When I first started working with Richard, we were all up in the finer points of church state separation and affirmative action. We want to be in the American public square. And it's why an organizing principle of work for organizations like the JCRC or AJC or ADL or any of us, we always refer back to the Hillel saying, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? And if I'm only for myself, what am I? And what we, it's an organizing principle for us. And so when Richard and I were thinking about, you know, what, what is the policy agenda of these two big organizations? We were trying to find that balance because Jews wanted to be present in both of those arenas. And we are in a situation now for very good reasons. Our organizations have rebalanced the equation. You can look all around you, no matter what organization you donate to, they've pivoted resources to anti-Semitism. There are times when groups like ADL are pulling resources from a lot of other things and saying, we're just doing anti-Semitism right now. We're just prioritizing Holocaust education or whatever it is. So our Hillel balance of our work in communities is understandably very, very focused on the particular work of Jewish safety. That's fine. I'm just noting a change. And it's just a fact. And part, and we've needed to do that for years. This didn't start on October 7th. And so we are a community that for very understandable reasons, we know a lot about what happens to people when they were scared. When Americans were scared after Pearl Harbor, a survey of public attitudes in the United States, when you asked Americans, do you think the internment of your Japanese neighbors is wrong? Only 1% of Americans surveyed said that it was wrong. And so it's just a fact of human nature. We are scared. And when we are scared, we focus on our safety. And it also is a bit of a turn inward. When And so unlike the 80s and 90s, even as advocates or as community leaders asking for help, we are having a lot of separate conversations about anti-Semitism. And when that happens, remember, we, we want special envoys, special offices, separate laws, separate processes. You know, in the 60s, we lobbied for the Civil Rights Act because it, it included everybody. And again, this is not an accusation. It's an observation about the change over 30 years. And so some distance has grown between the democracy movement, the anti-hate movement, and the Jewish community. It's very natural and understandable. And so when you need to fight for yourself, 
other civil rights work, community outreach, it feels like something you have to do in your spare time. And I think a lot of people feel like, look, I'm defending my students on campus right now or my children. So we perhaps haven't had what we think of as the luxury and the space to fully engage in community relations the way we used to when we felt safer. And we had we were sharing our happy, clappy experience of our victory over anti-Semitism with other groups of Americans that were having problems. And so the impact of that is that there have been new generations of social justice movements that don't understand anti-Semitism, don't have as much contact with Jewish issues. There are more diverse communities in social justice movements. And one thing that we have lost is we have lost a sense of everyday shared self-interest in fighting anti-Semitism and hate together. And we felt this before October 7th, and we felt it really, really acutely after October 7th. So many people were shocked. I work with a lot of progressive organizations and professionals and non-Jewish organizations and sensible people and sensitive people and Jews who weren't really affiliated. A big group of people were stunned at the intensity of how people did not recognize anti-Semitic language that showed up in conversations about October 7th. And again, we were hit with what hate does. And hate isolates, as I said, and it can use conventional frameworks against us against targets of hate. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And I think hopefully we'll have questions about it. So the isolation that we feel after October 7th, to many of us, looks like it just proves we can't rely on other people. We need more walls. We don't have time to build bridges with others. I tried to build bridges. It didn't work. I tried to build bridges, but look what someone in my office said to me. And so for us, it validates our fears and it validates our separateness in fighting this problem, which is a fair conclusion. I'm here to say that it's not the best way to keep us safe. So anti-Semitism, we believe what we say when we say anti-Semitism is a threat to America. It's a warning sign. It's a sign your democratic norms are shaky. It's a conspiracy that causes everyone to distrust authority and civic institutions. As more people buy into conspiracy theories, they lose faith in democracy and pluralism. So anti-Semitism is bad for everybody. But I think right now we need to double down on building that connection with partners. Anti-Semitism isn't for us to fight alone. We need solidarity and it's a threat to everyone. And in the frame in which I work, fighting anti-Semitism doesn't come at the expense of another group and fighting bigotry against another group doesn't diminish or disrespect me. It's side by side, and these forms of bigotry, anti-Semitism and racism and homophobia, are in a constant feedback loop with each other. There are whole departments at the Southern Poverty Law Center just studying how homophobia and anti-Semitism swirl around each other and feed each other and grow each other. So I think we're in the state where we got to relook at that Hillel in Aina Neely Mealy, and we've got to double down on it and have sort of the Hillel Maxim 2.0. It means that we have to fight and defend democracy and pluralism for the sake of our safety. Our safety is tied to the health of pluralism. And yes, the help of diversity and equity and inclusion that makes this a liberal democracy where Jews will be safe and free.
So we have to fight for democracy in order to protect ourselves. And America has to fight anti-Semitism because it's a threat to everyone. It threatens freedom and democracy. Securing American democracy means you better know about anti-Semitism because it animates and it fuels the extremist movement in our country. And so we're in a symbiotic relationship with other groups. We need each other. For some of us, it's kind of tactical. I want to do something nice for my neighbor so that they'll be sympathetic when I need something. Solidarity, that's fine. But we are in a state of such zero sumness. I have heard the anti-Semitism lead at a major organization say, corporate anti-Semitism, here's what corporate anti-Semitism is. Well, that's when a company condemns anti-Semitism, but includes other forms of bigotry in their statement. So not only do we not want to fight these bigotries together, but when someone says, and Islamophobia too, and homophobia too, they're almost in the category of an anti-Semite to us. Whether or not you believe that's true, I'm here to say it's undermining ourselves because we, what I hear over and over again is I feel alone. My friend, nobody understands. We want the connection with other people. And so we have to fight anti-Semitism and navigate the world in a way that brings us into partnerships and not into silos. Um, I'm looking at the time. I'd love to pause and see if maybe Richard, you have an opening question. There's so much more to say. Um, but I wanted to just open with a frame. Sorry, one more second, Richard, that we have a choice. So we can fight anti-Semitism in a way that's going to bring us more solidarity, more faith in partnerships. And I like partnerships, not because I'm a kumbayista, as my husband sometimes uses that word, because collective power is stronger than individual power. It's just more power. It's the right thing to do, and it's more powerful. Or we can reinforce fears that fuel partisanship and polarization and tribalism and even disinformation that we sometimes spread and that is going to make put us behind more bulletproof glass when what we want is connection with the American community. We want to be part of the country. We don't want to be a protected side class. Um, so, Richard, I'll stop and see if you want to throw out an opening question. I, I have and, an opening. Uh, yes. So th thank you, Stacey. That really was a, a wonderful, comprehensive uh, opening and uh, you, you've, you've covered the waterfront, but let me ask you to unpack a couple of things that you mentioned. Before I do that, let me just say to the audience, uh, if you have questions, again, please, there's a, under apps, uh, there's a, uh, there's a, you can, you can uh, raise your hand and, and uh, let us know if you have a question. Uh, also, uh, you can uh, add, type your question. I said, type your question to the chat earlier. Uh, there's a Q&A function under, on my computer, at least it's under the more section. You have to type, hit on more, and then Q&A will come up, and please type your questions into that if that's a better way for you to ask your question. Uh, so, having asked that, let, let me jump right away, Stacy, to a, probably what's a contentious area, and you mentioned it yourself towards the end, which is the whole question of DEI, uh, is, uh, the uh, I'm forgetting what the rubric is for for a moment. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right, right, right. Diversity, equity, inclusion, which has been raised in some quarters uh, as somehow the font of all the problems. You know, the, the, uh, there are folks that are pointing to DEI programs. And we had a speaker just showing the diversity of our presentations. We had a speaker several weeks ago uh, who spoke about, just in this vein, that the ideology underlying DEI that he said of oppressed versus oppressor with Jews being placed in the oppressor category was somehow feeding in the, what the anti-Semitism that's taking place on the left wing side. And you didn't you didn't provide a point to this, this orientation of left versus right, but certainly there's anti-Semitism on both the left and the right and in between in, in American society. So he pointed to that as sort of a the, the underlying ideological problem that's creating the, the anti-Semitism 
on the left and on college campuses. That's on the one side. On the other side, you have defenders of DEI who will tell you that there's no problem at all. And, and I, I saw one case where, you know, I pointed to uh, what's, what's happened in California, where in the name of, of eth education about ethnic uh, backgrounds, uh, Jews were being made safe, unsafe and were being demonized uh, through the way uh, Judaism and anti-Semitism was left out of the teaching about diverse groups, or if it, if it was included, there was stuff about Israel that basically painted Israel in just that oppressor oppressed category. So, so we have problems with DEI seemingly on the on the right, where it's the font of all problems, and on the left, where it's perfect and there's nothing that needs to be done to deal with the problems that are that are being created for the Jewish community. So I'd like, I'd appreciate your take on how we should understand that controversy. So how we should, so anti-Semitism is a lie about Jews to blame us for what's wrong. And as I said, there are different conditions that come up in society that make people feel nervous about change or turmoil and anti-Semitism comes up cloaked in those movements or those conditions. So it's not an accident that you didn't remember what the D, E, and the I stand for. The reason is because DEI is just a three-letter boogeyman in this polarized debate. No one knows what it is. People get asked all the time. Institutions get called by Jewish newspapers. Does your policy include does your DEI include Jews? They don't even know how to describe what DEI is. They just want to know it's, it's no bueno for Jewish people. And most people don't know what it is. So the, the letters DEI, I said them with trepidation, uh, are like CRT, critical race theory. Nobody knows what it is. No one can explain why it's bad. But politically partisan message machines drill the three letters into our head to say that boogeyman is coming to eat your children. And that's how information moves around this society. So DEI is not a driver of anti-Semitism. I know too much about anti-Semitism to think that. It's a part of society. It's a movement. And I wouldn't defend any movement perfectly because movements are messy. But the, to pit the people who want to pit Jews against equality, Richard, the reason we took our jobs, every single job we've ever had, are hurting us. And so there is no reason to associate a movement for equity with anti-Semitism any more than it makes sense to associate the movement for labor rights with the worst anti-Semitism ever espoused by a union official. So I reject the binary of that setup. It hurts me, it hurts Jews, and it pits us against our, our core beliefs, and for most of us, our religious beliefs. So, and I say that I cannot throw DEI in the trash can and I can't call it anti-Semitism, why? It should be obvious. I'm a woman working in the Jewish community where after all of these years, we're not in the C-suite. We're sitting behind the men, but the data are overwhelming. The number of Jewish women professionals in Jewish organizations goes up and up and up. And in positions of power, it goes creepy, maybe up a little down, up a little down. And so... I need DEI. I need to be considered as an equal. I need equality. But the binary thinking that movements breed, any movement, doesn't work for Jews. And I think talking about integrating Jews into inclusion work is good for society. It's educational. It's healthy. It teaches people about Jews. We don't fit neatly into those boxes. Get to know us. We're not exactly just a religion. People think of us as a race, but by the way, race is just a social construct. It's not a real thing. The Nazis thought we were a race. You don't think we are because we're white. Race is, is not a real divider. And so we can use it to challenge the buckets that people think we fit in and to challenge binary thinking, right? 
Jews aren't the number one DEI clients. Why? Because we haven't, when I work in a company, there is never a lack of Jewish representation in the executive suite. It's usually more than 2.5%. And I need to explain to ask those DEI departments, right? Because let's be honest, I'm being honest, it's a very, it's a big group of people. It's a big profession and an industry. It's a very big movement. And we need to try to make sure it works for Jews. But when I talk to DEI departments, I say, what's the goal? What is the goal of your DEI work? Is it to make sure people get hired equally, make sure people get a job interview? Okay, that's not a particular affliction of the Jewish community. Is the goal of your inclusion work to make all of your employees feel safe and supported at work? Oh, okay. Jewish people are very fearful right now because violence targets us very disproportionately. So if the goal of your workplace is to acknowledge that some employees are feeling nervous about when they go to shul on the weekend, you need to support Jewish employees. If your inclusion policy is around making people feel comfortable practice their religion, well, by the way, the number one complaint that I face from with Jewish ERGs, Jewish employee resource groups, is it's always about being able to leave early on Friday or just having somebody know that Pesach has the second number of days. Inclusive scheduling is the number one everyday issue that people talk about because most people go to work and they don't really need their employer to solve like the Arab Israeli conflict. They, they just, but they do need, they need to cook for the Seder and it takes more than one afternoon. Um, so the system for equity and inclusion, the pluralism project in this country needs to include us. And right now the industry of DEI is not itself anti-Semitic. It's a movement that needs to be improved because it was started for one thing and it needs to multitask. So that's that's the way I look at it. And I work with DEI departments all the time. Um, and I'll be honest with the audience, I don't have the best snapshot of all DEI professionals in the United States because if you don't, if if you're not a company that's really wanting to do the right thing for the Jewish community, you don't call the consultant who worked at ADL for 25 years. So I do meet a lot of the best actors, um, but it's it's a lot of people in America, and and to tarnish and say the movement for racial diversity in this country is itself a cause of anti-Semitism, that would feel like cutting my heart out. And I think there are too many Jews who would not want to cut that part of their heart out. So th thank you, Stacey. Uh, what I hear you saying, if I got this wrong, is it's not the concept of DEI, that's problematic, which is at the heart of promoting values that many of us have worked with for many years, but there can be problems in implementation. There certainly are problems in terms of DEI officials not recognizing the need to include Jews in those efforts at, at times. Uh, and that's something that we ought to be, we ought to be working on. Uh, so uh, there are a couple of hands raised as well as well, some questions in the chat. Let me talk, start with the folks that have raised their hands first. Uh, David Lackman, uh, you can feel free to unmute yourself and, and uh, ask your question. Great. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, really, I'm going to have to step out of this room because we have it on the speaker here. But... I think Stacy said the magic word uh, in uh, trying to un unravel this because, uh, you know, we have been part of solidarity movements for many years, both because it reflects our values as Jews uh, and also because there is a recognition that uh, it is safer for Jews to live in a decent society uh, that respects differences and uh, fights against discrimination. So, uh, there was a dual interest, uh, but Stacy used the word othering. And I think that that might be a useful way to look at this in the sense that uh, the Jewish community uh, takes on the aspects of whatever it is people find hateful or frightening. So for the right, we're the force behind communism. For the left, we're uh, capitalist exploiters. Uh, 
for uh, the right. Uh, we are bringing immigrants into the country to uh, replace uh, white Protestants. Uh, for the left, uh, we are something else. Uh, we're white colonials, uh, co colonialist settlers. Uh, and so it really is, um, I, I think when Stacy said uh, the lie uh, as to what it is the Jewish community is to take the place as the stand-in for whatever it is that is frightening or hateful uh, uh, is is probably a good way to uh, start the uh, analysis um, rather than going down uh, rabbit holes. Are Jews a race or aren't they? Again, uh, you know, when the Nazis uh, want to exclude us, uh, we're subject to their race laws, as my parents were. Uh, but when you talk to progressives in the civil rights movement, uh, it's like you can't say it's racism. It's not. It's you're you're not a race. Uh, even the word anti-Semitism. Uh, you know, uh, are you uh, aliens to uh, the Middle East, uh, uh, or are you, um, uh, or are you uh, uh, Semites who are intruding into our white European society? So that may be a useful. Uh, analysis. But thank you very much for this conversation. It's, it's very important. Thank you, David. Richard, you want to turn to Susan? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was not muted. Yes, I was. I, I was. Yes, please. Let's turn to Susan. I wasn't muted. I was muted. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, now more than ever, first of all, thank you both uh, Richard and, and Stacy, for really um, addressing such an important um, topic at this particular time. Um, now more than ever, we have so many challenges to address as Jewish community, as Jewish congregations and Jewish organizations. And those of us who are in leadership roles, whether professional or um, lay leadership roles, what would you say is the most critical? What is the greatest priority, number one? And number two, where is the lowest hanging fruit? Where can we make a significant difference or even a small difference relatively soon and um, that will have some impact? So look, if there was a magic, if if millions of dollars and a lot of power could reduce anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism wouldn't be growing in the United States because I have the great pleasure of getting asked a lot about philanthropy around anti-Semitism. And there was there's so much good money being thrown after bad in this moment. Um, I mean, bless all the people who are giving of themselves and their checkbook to this. But I, so I think we need to recognize that we've never been able to legislate, regulate, punish, incarcerate hate out of existence. It doesn't work. There's a, when there's a demand for it, there's always a supply. And I think one of the reasons I talk about working in partnership with other people is I watched very closely the tree of life shooting and that community responded and experienced that worst anti-Semitic massacre in our history. I don't know of any city in America where you can get shot at during Psuke de Zimra or Shacharit and be making Havdalah that night with so many other communities making Havdalah with you. And it's 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 not just about you know a vigil that happened although that does not happen everywhere and that the people in Pittsburgh still lost 11 lives but when you talk to all of them what did they do what did teenagers do they started crocheting blankets for afghan refugees just to give an example of something unrelated even to bigotry they were in relationship and those the people in squirrel hill talk about a security blanket that they had around them. In other words, the bulletproof glass and the and the security training, which we cannot talk about enough. And it's the only thing we can all agree to do with $500 million and it's necessary. 
But the security blanket that made them more resilient were the relationships they had with other people. Remember, there was a GoFundMe campaign in the Muslim community that raised a ginormous amount of money. I forget the sum, but that is exceptional. That is exceptional. And so I think when we're in partnership with other people, we don't have that secondary victimization, right? Like skinheads are always going to want to shoot into our synagogues, but what we hear now is anti-Semitism is rising. Hamas is an anti-Semitic terror organization. But what makes it worse is how I feel in the Montgomery County school system when my child doesn't get the support they need. And that secondary victimization is one that we play a role in helping avoid um, when we are working in solidarity with other people. I'm not saying this because I think it's more fun to work and build coalitions. I'm saying it because it's what everyone is saying they can't stand that we don't have. So I'm responding to that. So I think it's working in community with other people. And by the way, it's not, we we can't get this done alone. We, we just can't. That's why we started the whole structure of community relations in this country. We started getting together with other organizations because we were tiny, we were not empowered, we were scared, and we didn't know how to get it done alone. And getting something done alone is still not the smartest way to do it. If, so if I think I can, that is, yeah. If I can just clarify, I, I totally agree with the partnership. You know this. I totally agree that we need to work in partnership. My question was really focused on, are there particular partners who are, expressing a willingness or expressing an openness even to being approached that um, we haven't yet identified. That's what I was trying to get. And I apologize yeah. for interrupting. I, I've never had somebody say no. I just, what's, what's missing is not like send up a flare of willingness. We need to ask, we need to be in those relationships. And the the vernacular in our community right now is we are let down Nobody cares about us. I went to a George Floyd protest, but nobody did it for me. And there is a narrative that's taking hold. And sometimes it's true. And sometimes it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And when I look at coalitions that have taken a pro-Palestinian stance, right, like from Ferguson to Gaza or whatever, it's because another group of people was in those relationships while we were looking the other way. And being in the relationships has always made a difference. When, um, you know, we there's obviously so much polling data about all different kinds of ethnic groups and their anti-Semitic attitudes and favorable attitudes, either towards Jewish people or Israel, correlate to an interaction that the person had. It starts when somebody invited them to their Seder. You know, community relations, I'm glad it's the right thing to do, but I'm advocating for it because it's the most effective thing to do. It's not a silver bullet. Nothing is. But all the bulletproof glass on earth did not prevent Colleyville, did not prevent Tree of Life. And, you know, I was thinking last Yom Kippur when I was walking to shul and I went through the security thing, and I realized the entirety of my 21-year-old son's life he has never interacted with his Jewish identity without walking through a metal detector. And that didn't make me judge the people who want to shoot the anti-Semites. It reminded me what our approach to our safety does to us. It is a bad head to be in to walk through that metal detector because Kevlar is the only thing you can rely on because the society you're in doesn't care about you. And we promote that narrative, not because we're bad people, but because we're scared too. We are in the trauma. And every choice we make of what our legislative priority is, this organization, the JCRC, I see your legislative priorities and I see tippy top. Mm -mm, not good for Jewish safety. Feels good, not safer. Mm, safer. Mm, feels good, not safer. And it's really hard to look at your donors and look at your board members and say, 
we're not going down the rabbit hole of, of demonizing DEI or CRT or AFT or whatever the acronym of the bad guy is. We are building and we, I don't want my grandchildren to go to shul through a metal detector because it's not good for how they feel about themselves and it separates them from a society that has opened the world to us. And every time we talk about anti-Semitism, what are the metaphors we use? I'm going to ask to put in the chat, what's a common metaphor that we use to talk about anti-Semitism? Anyone. I can see a, a dozen people here who I know have written direct mail fundraisers on this. So if you survey it scientifically, it will not surprise you. There are two that come to the tippy top. One is the metaphor of water, a rising tide, a flush, a tsunami of anti-Semitism. Water is the most common metaphor. What's the second most common metaphor? I personally have never seen the adjective virulent used when it wasn't talking about anti-Semitism. Again, like Richard, I have a, a weird little niche of expertise. Virulent, the virus, we inoculate, we vaccinate. Anti-Semitism is always described as a natural phenomenon, like a flood, water, or a virus. What's the truth about naturally occurring phenomena? What can you do to prevent a tsunami? Nothing. What can you do against a virus? Well, that might be shifting after COVID, but those things are inevitable. And so if we talk about anti-Semitism as an earthquake, a natural force that's part of the elements of the world, then why do we even have a JCRC? If there's nothing we can do about anti-Semitism, just like we can't do a damn thing when a tsunami is coming, why did we set up our organization? Why are we saying we're fighting it? And so we need to remember anti-Semitism is man-made. It's a creation of humans. It's not in the elements. People make it and people can marginalize it. And anti-Semitism is not inevitable. Societies have needed it and drawn it in at different times. Interwar Germany, how were they going to explain all of those problems to people? Well, anti-Semitism and disinformation, the twin of anti-Semitism, that helped the Nazis convince Germany, the German people, that... All of their problems were because of 0 0.8, 0 0.8 of 1% of people that they'd never even met, but it works. And I believe our society does not need to need anti-Semitism. We can look at the conditions, the fear, the polarization, social fragmentation, right? What happened to Jews in the run-up to the Holocaust? They were divided away from their neighbors and, and their civic institutions and their professional organizations. So that fragmentation is bad for us. It's a precursor. Our isolation has always been unhealthy. And we all know, you know, the famous poem, first they came for the trade unionists. It's, it's just true. Um, I want to get Harvey to your question about campuses. Um, and here's what I would say. So first of all, I'm looking at your question. And since I already picked on Richard a little bit, I'll, I'll analyze this. So the data is that most people who get beaten up or shot, it is by a domestic extremist, usually what we would call from the right, even though I hate right and left, but it's a homegrown extremist. And that's overwhelming. It's an overwhelming majority of the violence um, pre-October 7th. So in the 30 years, right, we've been looking at this, it's overwhelming. And what's been happening on campuses, campuses where I've been working, is primarily the anti-Semitism is rhetoric, horrible rhetoric that's punishable in my view and unacceptable. And it's a sense of exclusion. 
And the worst thing that's happening to students on campus is, do you know how distracting this is? Imagine how just the color of your nail polish can distract a student from being able to learn. This is so distracting to a distractible generation that has trouble focusing on schoolwork anyway. So it is mostly not violence. Usually there could be one thing that maybe happens in the process of a demonstration. It's terrible and good universities are calling law enforcement in to investigate or prosecute those. Um, but so there, there, I don't see a rise of violence on the left. There is a rise of eliminationist rhetoric. And I think that schools are challenged right now because absolute free speech, free speech is not absolute. When you threaten someone, when you block the entrance to a school building, um, shouting things that are scary and threatening, it's not okay. And schools do open investigations into those, and they are. And the federal government is opening investigations into those. It, um, if you look at the, the rate the cases that are being investigated and prosecuted, um, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm challenging the premise of the question about rising violence because the data are overwhelmingly not saying that. But it's not an excuse for rhetoric that is eliminationist. So. What I used to tell clients about these chants, right? A year ago, I would say from the river to the sea is a phrase that lands meaning two completely opposing things to two different groups of mostly well-meaning people. To Jews, it's a call for elimination of the Jewish state and some people would say genocide. Um, and to others, it's just a call for freedom. Palestine will be free. And so I used to tell people, do not punish that speech. It's it, There are too many people chanting it that don't know what it means. It, it's almost like saying, I'm sure we know Jewish people who would have said blue lives matter or all lives matter. That is like sounds from the river to the sea to a person of color. So it just means too many different things to too many people. Since October 7th, there is so much awareness and exploration of what these chants mean that I look at it differently. An organized group of protesters on a campus who stand, particularly if they're standing in front of a Hillel or, or, or near the Jewish dining hall or on a certain day or a holiday, chanting those things, at the very least, they know that that is an intimidating thing to scream where Jewish people are walking. You know that you're hurting another group of people. It may be against university rules. It may not be against university rules, but I tell people to remind, to publicly declare that it's against their values to make people feel intimidated. It's not against the law to say blue lives matter. If you stand in front of a black student union yelling it, a group of young college student men who are scared to drive because they're scared of being killed when they're pulled over is very intimidated by that. And that runs against my values if I were a university president. So I hope that's a little bit clarifying, but I think the unfortunately the takeaway is this isn't easy. University rules don't have the tools for this. They, we, we weren't built for this. For most schools, you know, they haven't had a police presence on their campus, I don't know, since 1968. And now they're they're dealing with issues that were just unanticipated by all of us. If, if I could just follow up, Stacey, um, I, and I would tend to agree with you that, that the relative frequency of, of violence on the left is much, much smaller than on the right. But I would historically never read about it on the left. And now, you know, even if it's anecdotal, you do hear stories every week about you know, students being physically intimidated, if not actually harmed uh, on campus. My, one, my question goes a little bit broader to the, the, the approach that this professor, who's a pretty much a, a First Amendment absolutist, take, took a lot of the positions you took, took. He even approached this professor on campus with whom he had nothing in common, uh, who was a pro-Palestinian professor, and got them to agree on a statement that, you know, you can't attack other people, kind of a nothing statement, but it didn't lead to much change from the campus 
administration to, you know, to bring more protection for students threatened by violence. I wonder whether, you know, at sit-ins, I always thought of something started by students, not by faculty. Uh, I wonder whether, you know, sit-ins, you know, to protest uh, intolerance might be a, you know, a useful device to get people to think about what, you know, what they're saying and how hurtful it is. Well, um, Harvey, I agree with you. So first of all, I know very much about um, that professor and the statement that he authored, because a zillion people sent me, oh, Ron Hasner and Hatsab Bazian wrote this thing. He 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 authored a joint statement or op-ed with one of the founders of Students for Justice in Palestine. And so about that, I would say community relations isn't about writing one statement and suddenly having the problem dramatically improve. It's an investment over time. Our adversaries invest over time. Anti-Semitism tries everything. Anti-Semites throw everything against the wall and see what sticks. And eventually they reach people and they've been diligent for a very long time. We've got to be diligent. Ron Hasner does not regret doing something together with that professor who has said very extreme things because he feels, as I do, as much as he did a sit-in, his sit-in was a way to say, damn it, this problem is so serious. But he is not going to stop trying to be in relationships with people. Because let me tell you what happens when we stop trying to be in relationships with people. There are campuses where you can't get the rabbi or, or a student leader or an imam to even get in the same room together. And campuses have a silent majority. Um, I've stood around on campuses during protests, and I'll, I'll tell you who's who's the biggest group of people. The boys wearing like pajama pants, like to go to the library or whatever, and they are standing around saying, oh, darn it, I'm going to be late for my study group because they had to like close the door of the building I'm going into again. There is a big silent majority of students who want to learn. They the, the only person they hate is all the protesters and they lump the Jewish students in, although in places I'm following, the Jewish students have, there are always overreaches and rule violations by any group of students. But in, in the main, I, I see Jewish students having really constructive vigils and, and we should feel good about that. Um, but there is a silent majority of people who can't step out and support a victim of bigotry, whether it's a Jewish person, and there are Muslim and Palestinian and Arab looking students that are having things ripped off of, scar head scarves ripped off of their heads. That's not okay with any of us. But it's very hard to step out because they don't see their teacher talking to another teacher. They don't see a pro-Palestinian faculty member and a pro-Israel faculty member teaching a class together. And this polarization makes it harder for what I'll just call regular good people to say, you know what, I want to make some brownies for my Jewish neighbor because they're incredibly depressed. It's very hard for them to learn. They're so worried about the hostages. It's very hard for someone to say, you know what, I don't have a dog in this conflict, but I don't want to see people ripping down a hostage poster. And you do see in these viral videos, sometimes there's someone saying, why are you doing that? There are regular people, but when so I think what Professor Hasner did was was important for the people who saw it, because the lack of that conversation and those bridges, we see it and we say, I'm just going to hunker down, pull up the gangplank. I just want to stay in my dorm room. I don't want to sit. I don't want to care about anybody right now. And that is a real problem. And so the kind of sit in you're talking about any community, you know what, Stanford, if you look at all of the schools that we pay attention to, where you would Google, whether it's Duke or USC, you look, since October 7th or since George Floyd, they've launched initiatives about solidarity, their values, their community, their belonging. And some of them even offer grants for, for projects that bring people together because it's so I would not want to be a teacher trying to get 
Palestinian students and Jewish students to learn together right now. I, I, I just don't know what on earth one can do to manage the kind of diversity, right? We talk about, oh, there's people on the JCRC board from this side, from that side. A university manages a hundred groups of people that don't know how to talk to each other. And it's very, very challenging. So Harvey, there's not enough of that activity. And I know Jewish students, Jewish students are progressive. You think they wouldn't want to bake brownies for somebody whose whole family got killed in Gaza. And there are students from Gaza at these schools. There are people there saying, I don't know who's going to pay my bills less next month. My entire family was killed. Those students are there and those stories are galvanizing people. And the Jewish students that I know, their heart aches for that person. They just want to be able to walk to class without hearing genocidal chants while they're walking to class. They just don't want to be picked on for wearing a yarmulke. But it's very, very hard to see the kind of activity you're suggesting. We, we have, the, the clock is running down, but we do have questions that were submitted in the Q&A, and I hope we can get through at least a couple of them. Oh, let um, me let me look through yeah. those. Sorry, I didn't even open I, let me, them. Let me, I, but let me, let me. Okay, great. Instead of you reading them. One, one of them is, is pretty long, so I'm going to paraphrase. Uh, I hope I'm getting the question right, but it's on the point you made about not shying away from anti-Semitism being grouped with other forms of bigotry and hatred. And, and this is not the person who phrased it this way, but I've heard it phrased this way. Uh, that this is the other lives matterization of anti-Semitism. In other words, many of us recognize the, and, and you, you alluded to this earlier, the, the hurt that's felt by, by many in the black community when people say, for instance, all, all lives matter or blue lives matter. Uh, and here, for some reason, we're being told not to be concerned when anti-Semitism gets grouped with Islamophobia, with other forms of, of hatred, which we condemn, uh, but that nevertheless, Doing so dilutes the special attention that ought to be given to anti-Semitism, that uh, that sort of misses out, misses the point of anti-Semitism being conspiracy theory. So it dilutes it, and 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 turns turns us away from dealing with anti-Semitism as the special threat it is. Even as at the same time we want to be concerned about other forms of hate. So yeah, why, why, so yeah, so that's that question. So that's so question. the person asking that question is asking it in a very um, I'm reading the question. It's they're asking it in in exactly the right way. Um, I was just looking through to see what other. Uh, but here's what's going on. So absolutely, when there's an anti-Semitic incident in a school, the statement should say a swastika was painted on the door of the Hillel building. That is we will not tolerate anti-Semitism. In the next paragraph, a really good statement will say, here's what our values are. We oppose anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish bigotry, and all forms of bigotry. And so we need to understand, I agree with exactly how you phrased your question. We have to put a spotlight, right? when. It took 17 years for Asian Americans to stand up and say, I know we're shy, but we've been getting beaten up for a long time. And we needed strategies specifically to help that community, just like the Jewish community needs attention and support right now. But usually, hate crimes against all groups are going up by a lot. And uh, to me, if one trans person is murdered, that's terrible to me. And I want to share, I want policies that protect me and that person, that person's family or, you know, and so when we get into saying who's more or what's more, then we're in something that practitioners call the oppression Olympics. And that is a rabbit hole that we can fall down. I used to have people say to me, um, from all the organizations, they would criticize ADL's education materials because you can't just go into a school and teach about one thing. You need an anti-bias curriculum. And people from other organizations would say, you're equating anti-Semitism. Usually they would say with Islamophobia. That is a question that has no purpose. Like bigotry is terrible. 
a, you know, and someone, George Floyd's mother is crying as much as the mother of one of those tree of life victims. And we need to remember that pain is pain is pain. And if we want to be champions of human dignity, it applies to everyone, but we cannot all lives matter anti-Semitism. There is a point at which you can make something too universal. And, and let me put a finer point on that problem. Sometimes I work with people who are afraid of making another community mad. And I work with them on it because they're trying to be sensitive. They're trying not to get in trouble. They're trying not to offend. And what happens is they become like, I don't know, the European Union consensus statement. It's always like oatmeal, watered down, or maybe oatmeal tastes better, but it's very watered down, pablum, I guess. And I try to work with people and I remind them, you know, when the president of the United States was using words like hung flu about COVID, I say, did you reach out to Asian students? I promise the Muslims weren't angry. And so when you need to comfort students from a particular group, it's okay. You need to do that with confidence because people have needs. But if I'm going to be fair about that, then I, when I look at DEI and I look at all the economic inequity and all of the workplace discrimination that doesn't affect my group, I, I have to discern it and say, no, people need DEI. People need civil rights protections. And here's what I need from the civil rights infrastructure of my company or my university or my government. And it's we have different needs. And the only reason to look at different impacts of bigotry is to give people what they need. I get the second job interview. A Muslim woman my age, in addition to, I'm sure there's not enough men represented in the Jewish or Muslim professional community. I don't need to check on that. But a religious Muslim woman is wearing something on her head that causes people to judge her and maybe not call her for the second interview. I just don't face the same thing. So I don't need to say I'm the same as her because I don't. I have different problems. Some of them we share and some of them we don't. And that's OK, because when what you're trying to do is use the evidence and the data to support people in the way they need, then look at the evidence. But you know, I we always call anti-Semitism the oldest hatred. I'm never sure. Is it so old because Jews have been around for so long? I just think another group of people who were around that long, the ism against them, would be the just as old as hatred. So we have time. I have time for, for one more question if there is one. Sorry, Richard. There's a, there's a bunch more. Let me just ask one of them. And I apologize to those whose questions we're not we're not getting to. Uh, and it's really sort of a historical vantage point uh, it, with this growth of anti-Semitism. Was, was it always present in America and now the war between Israel and Hamas has sort of allowed it to become more vocal? Or is it something, you know, it, it, what's, 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 how does this, what's going on now relate to the presence of anti-Semitism over the history of the United States? I think anti-Semitism is part of nativism, racism, xenophobia, fear of otherness. And all of those things have a deep history in America. You know, it wasn't that long ago that uh, it said, you know, no dogs, no black people, no Jews on hotels. So I know we're afraid of the three letters CRT, but racism, anti-Semitism, and hatred is deeply embedded in the, the history and founding of this, of this country. It's just a fact. And we need to learn about it and we need to remember it. And we are in that mix. Um, so I don't think the, I don't think the Israeli-Palestinian conflict causes anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitic incidents did go down during the Oslo peace process era and I think it sometimes there are irritants that make anti-Semitism flare, but anti-Semitism went up with the onset of Trumpism. And I think when you take a big group of humanity and humankind, make them fearful and let them know all bets are off of what you can say about people, 
You can mimic a disabled person. You can grab a woman and you can still become president. Make us great again. You unleash what had been under the surface. And I and I think uh, hatred of Israel and Zionists is, is just another flavor of the lie about Jews to blame them for what's wrong. And the occupation of Palestinians or the lack of rights of some Palestinians living under, you know, a military administration is an injustice. And who do you blame? And so I think it's that base human nature. And we either send signals that you better shove that on, stuff those feelings, minority of people who are like that. But when we say, let it all hang out, people will. Okay. Oh, I, I think that we've now reached the witching hour. Uh, and so... Stacey, thank you so much for a terrific presentation, for really thoughtful responses to some challenging questions, and uh, appreciate it on behalf of, of the JCRC of Greater Washington, American Jewish Committee, the AJLJ. We want to thank you. We want to thank all the participants, all the people who, who listened in and asked questions, and we look forward to seeing you uh, another time at another one of our Grown Back presentations, whether as a Zoom program or, or in person. Thank you. Thank you all. Nice to see so many friends.